All right, I think we are live. Uh, this is Jesse Bergman. I'm here with Neil and John. Say hello, guys. Hey, guys. John might be off mic here, but uh, anyways, just... Um, he's are, lurking. He's lurking, that's right. He'll be in the chat. So if you're um, if you're watching us and, and on chat with us tonight... Um, well, right now you're seeing a black screen just between all of us because I don't think Neil's sharing his screen yet. But sorry, <laughs> Neil thought he was all ready to go. But uh, I, anyways, I did. We are we're doing something a little different tonight. I mean, the last few weeks we've been doing the uh, last few streams, I should say, we've been doing the welcome decks, and um, we've been uh, you know kind of play testing those, and we want to continue that uh, down the road. Um, probably do a little bit more off stream and try to get things done there. But uh, in the short term, we wanted to talk about um, Brain of Terror, the Pratoan, and um, the Good, the Bad, and the Savage. So the Brain of Terror Pratoan shipped last week to all of our pre orders. It's now available for general purchase on our website. And um, it's all over the world. All over the world, yep. Oh, and then uh, Good, the Bad, and the Savage will be shipping here in the next couple of weeks. But since the files were at the printer, we thought, why not update TTS? And why not spend some time talking to each of you guys about what is different from the alpha version, if you've downloaded the alpha version of Reign of Terror on our website, and you are um, now looking at the new Omega cards coming out with all of their art and things like that. So we're not going to go through each and every individual card tonight. We're going to try to hit the cards that were changed from Alpha to Omega. And then um, once we've done that, we will circle back. And if you want to look at specific cards or um, maybe if we have time allows, we can just kind of quickly run through the other cards that haven't changed that maybe have new artwork because uh, it'll be kind of the first time that we've revealed all of that. So, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of go from there, but uh, Neil, is there anything I missed on that? Anything we, I should cover with the guys and gals that are watching? No, I think you covered it all. I mean, if you guys are in the Midwest, uh, these changes will be live for the nationals tournament next month. Right. Yep. That's um, that's true. I, I, nationals will be announced in the next uh, probably week or so, and um, you know we can tell you that the date is November seventeenth, but all the details on the prize structure and everything like that will be out in the next week. So um, that's exciting news as well. We're excited to see all four factions uh, go at it here in the next uh, the next month. So. All right, so maybe we should get started, Neil, uh, unless there's anything else we should add here. But we'll start with Reign of Terror. Um, and so specifically, there, there wasn't a lot of changes for the Pratoan here. Um, just a few, mostly, uh, mostly wording and, and cleaning up some of the wording and then just getting some of the cards to behave um, the way we I think we wanted them to before you know after we released them into alpha and kind of saw some some tournament data from great plains and PretzCon as well as um just our internal testing that continued even after alpha was was completed um so let's uh let's kind of dive right into that and i think the first one should we just should we just go come out guns blazing right away and and show the biggest change up first or should we wait for that that guy and show him a little bit later well, I think we've talked about some of these changes already on stream, so. if uh, if you haven't paying attention. Um, yep. We added a new keyword yep. uh, to the sites, and I'm trying to find them in here right now. So I think it'd be Sublayer and Carapace Dome, both right. have that. So Sublayer is going to be in card Carapace 23 Dome. There. And... It probably isn't 23 okay. anymore. It's probably yeah, because I moved it. <laughs> yeah. All right. But, so... Uh, yeah, so let's talk about Lair for a second, um, you know, and, and kind of talk about what the anticipation of the mechanic is and, and why we wanted to do this. So this actually, this this keyword goes back to some very early design inspiration for Solaria. And when we first started testing Battle for Solaria back in, 
well, I started in, in 2011, but most of the team came on in 2012. Um, sites and position of sites was an inherent ability, meaning that certain sites would tell you that it was the front row site or certain sites would tell you that it's a rear row site. And that meant that you had to build the site into those positions. And ultimately through testing, we learned that that was just kind of not the way you wanted all the sites to behave in the game because of the random nature of the draw. And, and so it left a lot of circumstances where it took some of the strategy and choice away from the player that we were really aiming for. But it inspired Lair. And what it, what it means is, is Lair is by definition um, an ability that as long as that site is in your front row, your opponents cannot attack a site that doesn't have the Lair keyword. So if you have two layers in your front row, then they can choose which layer they want to attack. But if you only have one layer in your front row, then they must attack that site, which is kind of dictating your opponent's uh, attack patterns. Yep. And that ability is very similar to the Carapace Dome ability if you played it in Alpha, um, where Carapace Dome just essentially said the same thing, except it, instead of referring to the site by keyword, it referred to it by name. And it just said, if you control a site named Carapace Dome in your front row, your opponents have to attack a site named Carapace Dome. And right. So it still does a very similar thing. It's slightly different because if you have the subterranean layer and the Carapace Dome in your front row, they can choose to attack the subterranean layer, which they wouldn't have used to be able to do. But this is also a big buff to subterranean layer, uh, which is a site that, like Carapace Dome, you, it wants to be the target of your opponents attacking. It has a very defensive oriented ability and uh, um, so having the layer keyword and funneling your opponent's guys into the subterranean layer is very positive for the card. Right, right. And and so one of the things that we um, we like about this layer keyword is uh, specifically being able to to implement it into future design so it gives us a really neat place to 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 play with when you start talking about what if this was the only site your opponent had to attack like what if that was the case like what what could be there and so sub is a perfect example of like leveraging that where it's like sub training layer gets plus six plus zero and alpha strike while only one combatant is attacking it well there, there, it's very possible like you may have like a jotun small guy that you can cloud you know cloud stronghold and exchange and swap with the sub layer and you're ultimately going to probably try to avoid the triggering of its ability altogether but uh, you know that's exactly what we want layer to do we want it to dictate an opponent's play pattern and, and force them into doing things maybe a little less optimally than they would prefer um right i, I, I actually played a few games last night uh with our friend Zach and uh, there were just like situations where you would end up with a, it was just very common to have two sites in play in the back row and a sub layer in the front. And it just completely stymied, uh, you know, your opponent's attacks. Cause normally yeah. you'd be able to, I'm trying to find an example here. So whoops. So if I, you know, I have something like this going on and my Despot Forest is like wide open if this was any other site. And it's especially effective against like a red condor who even if you only had this, uh, just like one in the front, one in the back, this, the flyers would get over it. They can't. And it it makes a big difference. You end up with some interesting... Uh, site layouts as the game goes longer with your like like you'll have like layers in the front row and like sites over here well like, and, it's kind of weird and, and thematically one of the things that I think I really like about this especially in the Pertoan is you know the Pertoan are this kind of this tribal you know primal creature type thing and it makes sense that like their dens and things like that would only be accessible through a single point of entry. They just they just aren't very likely to just build things out in the wide open, right? Like their their right. homes are deep underground and and so you know, there's some very cool artwork in that uh realm on sublayer as well. 
Right, right, exactly. It re really reinforces the theme, and uh, uh, Philip has just knocked this card out of the park, in my opinion. Like, we clearly got some Exilarians look like they might be anarchists, and and uh, we'll get to those guys in the in a little bit here. But they're they're clearly entering into a, a space that's not very friendly to them, and that's exactly what we wanted from a thematic side. So, I mean, John has just done an amazing job of, um, you know, continuing the thematic directions of our artwork. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, matching mechanics to the artwork and, and vice versa. So, I, you know, our hats always go off to John for the work he does there. Um, Carapace Dome didn't change visually from the Alpha Edition, so we won't we won't go into too much. You've probably had plenty of chances to look over that card. Um, I want to take some time, though, and, and reveal the next card from the Protoan that took a change from Alpha to Omega. And uh, this one we've talked about a lot more. So you may very well have, have seen it, uh, heard about it, understood that it's coming. But uh, sometimes, you know, just getting the visual re-representation is important there. So let's, uh, let's pull out the Megalithid, Neil, if we can. Because uh, I think, yep. I think uh, that's the only other one that we changed from Omega on this faction. We, we were pretty happy with this uh, faction overall and how it performed, um, you know, going so. into Alpha and uh, really didn't see a lot of tweaks needing to be made. Right. So again, if you've, if you've been watching the stream, we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, if you hadn't been watching the stream or not paying very close attention, because the actual image on this card was the alpha version for a long time, and it just had a, a big old nine in the corner. Right. And uh, so this... we, we, we reduced the solarium cost from nine solarium to seven solarium in the final version of the card. Yeah, that's that's a big buff. The a this big card buff. Uh, in the original Reign of Terror fire at, file actually was like this. It, it was a seven cost card, but uh, in testing we decided that was too good. So for the alpha version, we had increased it to nine. But now yeah, we're we, back. <laughs> yeah, we brought it back down. So we we wanted to. So that's a lot of times what we'll find when we're doing internal testing is. Uh, we may believe a card is is uh, performing in a space that's above the curve. We we believe that or we think that, and and so using the alpha program and feedback from all of you that that play the alpha and uh, provide us feedback. First off, we want to thank you for that. If you are still participating in alpha, don't forget to send us updates because it's it does directly impact the final versions of cards. But um, Megalithid just just turned out to to be a little too slow at nine um it was it was overperforming in a format that like was different than the format we have now in correct. at a time when the four factions were together and there were uh it was a little bit slower and there were some different things going on mm -hmm. so we slowed it down but then when we started working into cycle pack one which you'll if you've been in the alpha program you've seen those cards it was a lot more underwhelming at nine. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was just too. It was too slow as a faction evolved into future sets. Number one, number two. Um, what we what we came to kind of come out of all of this was is you know splitting the difference wasn't going to make that much of a of a difference in the cards behavior. Uh, moving forward. And then there was some changes in the original ROT testing as far as um, what other cards were valued at and how they behaved. And, and, and in, the old, in the old Reign of Terror fire, file, the token producers were better. Specifically, Matterox was like made tokens a lot better than it does now. It's still a great card, mm -hmm. uh, but it's slower than it was at the time that, that Megalith was too good. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big reasons that it got pushed to nine. And now that's not the case anymore. We're back to seven. And he's, he's, he, he's what we want. <laughs> uh, he's what we want. He's a big bomb, but he's, um, he's not, I don't think he's overperforming any longer. And I think he's in a good place for longevity as well. So this will be a card that will, we'll probably see quite a few Protoan players list for quite some time, just because of the value that he brings. Um, you know, as a one CC card, but everything else about the card stayed exactly the same. Uh, we were just playing with how much resources it took to actually put them on the battlefield. So um, I don't, we don't have any chat going on right now. So Neil, as far as that goes, I don't think uh, we have any questions specifically to answer. So do, do you want to, do you want to look at some of the art on the cards that didn't change? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, I figure if we do a half hour for each faction, we're 15 minutes into the Protoan right now, so we can probably do that. So I definitely think the card right on the top is a good one to start. And, of course, we can showcase all of John's work, too, because uh, John got to do one of the things that he loves to do, which is illustrate and, and put some of his illustrations into the game, which up to this point, there'd only been one other card of his uh, in the game. And now he's the Protoan represent his work um substantially more than what he's done in the past so so i'm going to set aside these ones that have had art throughout the alpha program um because they've probably been seen before yep. and obviously if you have purchased the this pack you'll have seen this artwork already um but there's some some cool ones here so Agreed. That's it. Yep. So you can see that when we went to Kickstarter, these were the cards that didn't have illustrations yet. They were either illustrations that were in the works or uh, illustrations that we hadn't commissioned yet. Um, but then through our pre-order process and all of your guys' support, we were able to finish up the faction and, and get it out the door this year. So uh, obviously we thank everybody that pre-ordered and bought the product. And uh, now it's obviously we got to start sharing the sharing it with everybody. <laughs> So, all right. So let's start with Deathspore. So this is an Ascari piece. Uh, I love Ascari's artwork. He's always got such a distinct style. Um, so you've got these little spores, and you got Acid Pool, who, who's uh, uh, Ascari as well. So those are both Ascari pieces there. Um, I, I just like the like the capturing of these little spores that Ascari has managed on the card. The, on the Deathspore. Yeah, yeah. It looks really cool. And of course, Acid Pool. Clearly, this is not a happy place for anybody that's not a Bretoan. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a happy place for the Bretoans. Like, probably not. Those, but... those don't look all like human bones, but <laughs> no, no. But this, but you never know. There could be some other beasts out there in the wild somewhere. So, no, it looks uh, really good. Yep, for sure. Um, and then we got, I think, the card to the right is uh, set um, miasma projector. Yeah, I Miasma mean, Projector is the next one up. Yep. yep. All right. So I'm, I'm working backwards, so I'm trying to keep an eye on things. So Miasma Projector, or, or as we more affectionately love to call it internally, the Poo Cannon. So <laughs> John always wanted to just name this card Poo Cannon, but uh, we wouldn't let him do it. So Philip knocked this, this one out of the park. Here's this giant uh, Miasma Flinging Cannon that uh, is not friendly for your opponents at all. So... I think that card's amazing. Then, of course, we already talked about Sublair and what Philip did with it. Uh, let's so then at, we let's look at Mount Kalara real quick because it's another uh, Philip. Philip. All right, so there's Mount Kalara. This is a Type One site for the Protoan, and um, it it borders on the west end of the Ashfall Plains. So um, if you're kind of in your head visualizing what Solaria looks like on a map, you've got uh, Bergheim, which was the nearest Jotun biodome to the Fracture on the east side of the Fracture. You had the Fracture with Centropolis in the center of the Fracture. On the west side of the Fracture, you had the Westfall Plains, and then on the far end of or the Ashfall Plains, the Westfall Plains, the Ashfall Plains, and then on the far end of that, you have Mount Kalara. And of course, Mount Kalara is a volcano that is active and dumping ash all over the plains, so that gives you kind of a little bit of a look and uh, the cool thing about this image is that if you look closely you can see there's some man-made items in there so clearly this volcano uh, kind of blew itself up out of the ground during the fracture and when it did that um, it, it still kept some of the remnants of an ancient civilization you know pre-fracture civilization on the on it so uh, so the the flavor text you know was this place man-made is, is very appropriate because current Solarians have no idea and then another Ascari is Metamorphosis Chamber. I, yep. I think it looks like the Predator. Yeah, it kind of does. I, I, I love I love this <laughs> image. I mean, it's it's perfect for exactly what it is. You know, these these Protoan enter into this chamber of ooze and goo and not so friendly place and they come out of it bigger, stronger, and faster. Um and so, of course, we love the flavor text here. We barely escape. The rune tunnels of the old Solari in this region are inhabited by beasts we've never seen before or want to see again. Uh, that's that's definitely, uh, you know, coming from some random ex guy talking about, or girl, talking about, you know, some of their explorations and uh, what, they're, what they've kind of gotten themselves into now. And then all the rest of them are actually... Uh, John's? John's. Are, so are you on, John? Do you want to talk about these? 
I don't know if he's still got audio. I, yeah, I don't know if his mic's... Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit. All right, so let's start with Lifeblood. Sean, talk about it for a little bit. Sure. So some of these were pretty abstract in terms of trying to match up uh, the mechanics with visuals. But this one, the uh, mechanically speaking, you would sacrifice a Pertoan, right? And or harvest a Pertoan and get Solarium from it. So based off of that, I guess it was maybe a little straightforward, but showing the corpse or the, you know, the remains of a Pertoan that I think in a few images, it kind of implied that maybe the Pertoan feed off of Solarium naturally, but then as their bodies fossilize, they kind of crystallize back into Solarium. So that's kind of what's happening here when this particular Pertoan passed away, it becomes like the, the fertilizer for another like bed of Solarium. And that's what's happening with lifeblood. So Visually, that might be kind of straightforward, but I don't know if we really talked about the motivation for Proton with their need or use of Solarium as much as we have with some of the other factions. So that's kind of touching on that possibility of yeah. how they how they can uh, how they process Solarium. No, absolutely. So, and I I think it does an excellent job of that. You know, these got these little critter Protoans, you know, obviously feeding and growing big off of. Uh, the lifeblood of Solarium. So it's right. just like the Lion King, really. Yep, it's a circle of life. <laughs> circle of life. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so let's uh, let's move on to Obama, John. So Obama is, um, uh, you know, a, one of my favorite images from you on this uh, on this set. And Thanks. So I'd like to for you to kind of go into what what was your uh, kind of your inspiration for it and you know stuff like that. Sure. Uh, we we had a number of images already completed by other artists for the set when I started working on some of these. And uh, that kind of guided some of the visual direction that I was going with on these. But again, a lot of these are also kind of driven by the the mechanics of the actual card. So with the Obama, you can you can surrender another Protoan combatant to make one stronger. So in this case, it's a little bit off to the side, but there is a Protoan that's being surrendered or sacrificed, basically uh, fed, if you will, to to another one, which allows the Obamid in particular to become larger, stronger, meaner, etc. And it kind of implies that use in another reference to Solarium being used by the Protoan, it kind of naturally like energizes his his body, so he starts to kind of have this glow effect that occurs from literally feeding off of uh, this fellow now dead Protoan. So that's why it has like the leech, if you will, suckers on it. Yeah, and, he looks uh, like the, like the brain thing from Battle or from Starship Troopers. Yeah, yeah with the like little sure. sucker guy. I can definitely see that, and it, it's uh, I love this this visual representation of the mechanic because one of the things that I always pitched in the early Protoan design was that you know these guys are kind of primal, and so they 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 feed off their young to get stronger, and and the Abomid really continues that trend in the design space. So to see the visual representation and not just have that be some other giant guy it, to me is is really cool. See, so next one up would be the uh, a Timurus Queen, maybe. Yep. All right, let's let's talk about a Timurus Queen, John. Again, similar in, as far as uh, trying to represent how they might process Solarium in this uh, way of in their circle of life, like you guys <laughs> just said. Um, they give off Solarium. They feed on Solarium. Uh, they had this hive mind mentality and structure, which is kind of, in this particular example, we've kind of gone back and forth between insectoid-ish, reptilian-ish uh, references to their overall design. 
And because the nature of the Bertoan, they were originally like a biological weapon. Um, it's a virus, if you will, which also relates or speaks to one of the other mechanics that infects a life form, starts to twist it to a specific shape or similar shape, even if it gets into different life forms. So sometimes it gets into these insect type native creatures on Solaria and it morphs over time. They evolve into something a little different, of course. And then some of the other more reptilian creatures, similar over time, they start to mutate or morph into other, other forms. There's some parallels between all of them. Some of them kind of have a little bit of a reptilian quality. Some of them have a little bit more of an insect quality, depending on at what point in evolution of that particular creature that it's in determines how much it might look like that original host creature that the virus infected. Um, so yeah, this particular one is a little bit more insectoid, and but it still has characteristics, and some of those characteristics of the other Protoan being that kind of ghostly or very light electrical, almost blue glow that speaks to the solarium. The bioluminescence, right? Yeah, the bioluminescence. That's a, a, a much better way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love this because you see the little um, you see the little terabytes, you know, in their early larva stage before they evolve into, you know, Tot's representation of those um, as as tokens. So, uh, right. the Timmer Queen is awesome. She's a great card, and and uh, you know, I think the image is very fitting for what she's doing. Okay, so uh, we got up next is. Uh, my my personal favorite in the Protoan line. I mean, yeah. I just love Matarox and and uh, yeah. This is like, I I think this is your best work of the set, John. And really, uh, I I just I love. <laughs> I I mean, I'm a little biased because I really like the card also. Yeah. I just, I just I love the way this one looks. Yeah, I, I I like the more you know this this is a, I mean we can I'll let you talk about it first and I'll provide my feedback. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So. This is just a, a response to trying to create more variety in the look of the Proton. And for me, uh, I did kind of the combination insectoid reptilian thing with the Obamid. And then I, I went like hard into the insect side with Itimerous Queen. And then I think the Matter Rocks was kind of just a response to me doing those other pieces. Uh, and then it speaks to, again, the mechanics of uh, another way of representing how one protoan can i guess procreate so to speak it it pops off little versions of itself in a kind of a gross way and <laughs> uh and then artistically speaking i didn't really sp talk about those that term in regards to the previous images but for this one in particular i've always been a fan of artists like brahm and this kind of in my opinion, feels like it's kind of Brahm inspired. Uh, Brahm did a lot of illustrations for D and D back in the day in the '90s for like the Dark Sun series. This kind of looks like a creature out of the Dark Sun series for D and D, uh, and and then he also did work for a bunch of other trading card games, of course, and continues to do stuff. So, anyways, that this is kind of like my Brahm interpretation of a Protoan. I, I I think all of your cards to me like I I pull a lot of Ron Spencer out of them. I think you know in a in a huh uh, yeah I can see know, that. Just I think they're tighter lines than what Spencer typically does, but um, that's that's definitely something that I I get out. But I I do like the the complete like you know he's he's like the ac like really bad acne version of a Protoan, but. Um, you know, I just think he's he the muted colors, the lack of that kind of bioluminescence that we've seen kind of permeate through multiple Protoan pieces. Like this is just the, something totally different. It shows just another like line of of things that that go on in the Protoan that make them so diverse. Exactly. All right, so uh, let's let's jump over to Mindshell, and then we've got two more, and we're going to have to talk about these a little quick, otherwise we're going to go long on talking about Exelarian tonight. Yeah. So the Mindshell. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, this was this was loosely inspired. If you uh, was at the Great Wall with Matt Damon, 
last summer, the summer before that movie came out where uh, spoilers, it's like medieval Japan or China, excuse me. And this particular province is being attacked by dragons, if you will, but they're not, they're like aliens. And they have this hive structure and in a, in a, in a funny way, there's probably a group of Protoans. I felt like out of any like movie monster, these were like the closest to what I initially had in mind for like the majority of what Protoans would look like. And these particular creatures, uh, they had these guardian versions that protected their queen and they had these appendages like horns that would project out of their head or their skull. And it would act as like a, a barrier to protect the queen. And in a way that's what this particular card's referencing. It has these, horny protrusions that stick out of the head and they create kind of like a bio electrical shielding uh, that protects the, you know, a given protoan from in our game, mechanically speaking from certain effects. So that's, that's what was the inspiration for that. And literally being, it had, it has a glow, if you will, of like an actual physical shell mm -hmm. just resonating again with the overall aesthetic of, how these are kind of a cross between reptilian and bug-like or insect-like critters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a perfect representation, and it's exactly what I thought too. Is a, that Great Wall movie not a great movie to watch? But uh, boy, it was they, okay. They, they surely represent <laughs> like uh, uh, they represent a lot of how I think Protoan behave. You know, when I saw that movie, I was like, man, this is basically our Protoan. But uh, yeah. Yeah, we just don't have the budget to get it out before them. <laughs> no, nope. that, that's what's funny. Like we, we we had our stuff done before that movie ever came out, but yep, yep, it just wasn't yeah. in, out there yet. So, all right, so let's move on to Dragos, and I love Dragos. He is cool. Um, so talk a little bit about like your motivation for Dragos. What what um, what did you want to accomplish? And on the yeah. Like that? Sure. So he's a flyer, and we already had some. Uh, we had flyers if you will like serana already produced so i wanted something comparable a little bit to serana um it's the devourer so i wanted to imply that it's while maybe other protoan feed on other protoan or on other creatures other factions literally if you will uh i wanted this one to to really represent that it's it is like an alpha predator it it's very carnivorous. Um, it has, it's very predatory in the sense that it has kind of its own little den, if you will. So it's got its pile of bones it's sitting on. Um, it shows a part of Solari that's still kind of messed up, if you will. There's a lot of volcanic activity. Uh, there's a lot of uh, atmospheric uh, debris, if you will, from volcanoes, etc. Sorry about that. And... <laughs> um, I also wanted to, it kind of shows a combination of, it kind of has like these praying mantis like talons that it uses to impale its victims, um, which are a little bit more on the insect range. It has some of the reptilian characteristics with the leathery wings and maybe the tail, but also kind of has a little bit of an implication of like a humanoid type structure as well. And so it's, it's kind of the pinnacle maybe of its particular species of Protoan where it's kind of this highly evolved balance of multiple different genetic structures all occurring in one critter. Uh, it has a little bit of an exoskeleton with that really bony head. If anything, if the, the talons don't kill you, like literally kind of flying, sacrificing itself, like nose bombing, literally nose bombing, or head first into its victim and like using its head as like a hammer. Um, and then it can drag its maw across any like surface and rip it open. So it has a very uh, savage looking head in that respect. Um, I probably, you know, this is one of those pieces where it's getting a little bit carried away with some of the detail and some of the information going on. Part of me wanted to put a little bit more of that bony protrusion stuff at different parts of the illustration, but um, I decided not to do that. And at the same time, by minimizing, I think, that element or aspect of the creature, it just emphasized 
kind of the brutality of just that particular spot. Like, for example, you know, we see lions out in the wild. It's not like everything about them is super savage, but definitely the, the, their, their jaws and their claws. Um, other things like a tortoise, you know, the shell is the hard part, the protective part, but then the rest of it's, you know, not so, it's not the same. So I kind of like that asymmet uh, the asymmetrical design of that. So, yeah, no, I think it conveys very well. And if uh, there are dragons on Solaria, this guy has got to be on the front runner for being the dragons of Solaria. <laughs> I mean, he's he's pretty he's pretty sweet. So, uh, I look forward to you know as we explore that brood more in the lore and and how that evolves. Uh, being able to talk to our fans about it, but. Um, let's move on to Bloodlust because we're about five minutes over and then we'll, we'll jump into the Exolarian right away. So, um, so with yeah, Bloodlust, so, yeah, go ahead, John. Let I was going to say, so Bloodlust is, uh, is this the last one I did? I'm trying to think now. This is it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, unless I missed one in the pile, but I think I got them all. I believe there's seven total. Yeah, that would be seven. Yep. Okay. So bloodlust is just another way it's, this is kind of like the de facto for me, the de facto Protoan look. And, uh, it, it shows kind of their subterranean or underground origins. They don't seem to be too affected by, uh, pressure, temperature, I, you know, lava, literally the heat of, of being underground as much. Um, it kind of implies that they're so savage, they'll they'll go through their own, which is kind of represented by the blood, um, just to get to a new prey, etc. So, this is trying to represent that they're kind of charging, they're kind of crawling over each other, they're ready to strike. Um, yeah, it's all it's kind of all in one in that one image, or tr trying to be. I think it conveys it well, and and I love the uh, flavor text. You get you get to do most of the flavor text. That's one of the things you, the touches you get to add to the cards, and I just love the flavor text on this one. You know, which implies that clearly Doctor Lerner sees that that this is a menace that that uh, goes well beyond even what the fracture represented to the to the world at the time that it occurred. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, I I guess I don't really talk too much about the flavor text in any of these, but I do try to, you know, in the in the first not to go long, but in the first few, the first two factions, Joe Tune and Cynthia and Jesse and I went back and forth a lot on uh, hammering out those uh, the flavor text. But then as Jesse and and Neil and in our past guys like Matt and Frank and others were play testing, they started focusing more on just dialing in the mechanics and making sure the wording for the mechanics were as tight as possible. And then as I was collecting art, it just seemed to make sense that kind of as the art was coming in, I could quickly put together some flavor text. And, and then if, uh, if, if it didn't make sense to the team, then of course we went back and we made some edits, but overall, yeah, those just kind of come in as the art comes in. So glass been working out so far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Well, uh, and thanks again for, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy you got to do some illustration work on this set. I know that's something that, you know, when we started this process many, many years ago, that was, that was what we wanted to do, right? We wanted, <laughs> right. we wanted to have you feature your illustrations and artwork and, and, you know, that was the whole intention. And then obviously the projects were just way too ambitious for a single person to do artwork. And then that evolved into, you know, uh, what we have today, which is, um, where we've got a bunch of artists from all over the globe working on the game now. But uh, so it's nice that we got your artwork back in the game and I hope we can continue to do that in the future on things as well. Yeah. So for sure. All right, man. Well, let's, uh, let's jump in, Neil. Let's, let's uh, see if we're, we're about 10 minutes behind. So I'm going to see if we can kind of yeah. rapidly fly through. Um, the, so uh, I tried to grab the x while John was finishing up there, but apparently I just grabbed a disruption. Can you grab the, pile out of the bag <laughs> yep thanks yep no problem all right so the Exolarian saw some pretty significant changes over the course of alpha to omega uh, those changes were not easy to come by uh, a lot of it had to do with 
the behavior of anarchy. And to, to make that clear, anarchy as it works today was not the way it worked when we did original reign of terror testing um, two years ago. It used to do some crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so the current version of anarchy, while good, was, was very much um, tuned down from uh, where it used to be. And so the new version is performing in a space that we absolutely love, but some of the cars that were interacting with Anarchy were just a little too uh, slow and somewhat expensive and, um, and, and kind of punishing to playing the, the mechanic. Uh, and of course, uh, in current alpha mayhem is, is a very good Anarchy card. I'm sure many of you are probably playing mayhem if you're Exilarian players, but taking escalation out of that, the anarchy suite coming out of the good, the bad, and the savage needed a little bit of help. And so uh, we, we decided to look at the entire anarchy package and starting first with the anarchist, if we can. Um, basically what we have here is we, uh, we gave him the keyword quick, which was something he was missing before. Um, and, and that was really the only major change. Now we, we had tested anarchists in the past with quick and, in the old version of Anarchy, Anarchist with Quick was uh, just bonkers good. Um, but yeah, the, because of the old way that Anarchy counters worked, he would just like kill your one drop and two drop site every game. Right. Like no contest. And that wasn't very good. So then he lost Quick. And then they added a slam to his ability because he was still really good. And then we changed Anarchy. So we kind of like did it in backwards order to. Right. <laughs> but it was, the Anarchy change was a more like a decision that we came to after the fact, but Anarchist yeah. kind of suffered because of it. Yep. Yep. And so when we came to Omega, we felt like it was time to re-enable quick on the Anarchist to help give some tempo. So if you are capable of making three Solarium, Anarchist is uh, able to put that first Anarchy counter out, uh, which gives some nice synergies with Booby Trap. Um, you know, it, it, it lays a good foundation for Solomon to follow up the next turn. Uh, things like that. So we wanted to uh, start seeing Anarchist be impactful in the early game. And in order to do that, he just needed to be a, a little bit faster without, but he still needed to have a cost associated. So we definitely left the activate and pay one solarium. We we felt that was important to um, his outcome. And of course, Wizukuza uh, just, I mean, if, if you can embody an image of an Anarchist, Wizukuza just nailed it with this piece. I mean, it is by far... Uh, just phenomenal. Uh, I just love the sense of perspective and the action associated around this guy. And uh, he's definitely uh, shows like he's going to be wrecking havoc on a battlefield for sure. So, should we move on to Anarchy then? Right. This was a very small change. Um, we changed the wording of the card, but it functions the same as it did before. Uh, but we made it a CC cheaper for deck construction. And so while I say it's a small change, that might be a very big change. Um, but if you just looked at the card, you might not notice. <laughs> uh, right. Right. So so obviously, Ascari, we're back to Ascari pieces here again. I mean, this is just awesome. This mob rule an anarchy going like, on. Like a movie uh, poster for Thunderdome. Exactly. I, I just, I love this to death. And and we kept the timing of Anarchy at five. Um, we thought that was important that it, it still had a more of a mid late game impact on the game. Uh, you, you bring that threshold down on this card and it becomes very potent at eliminating powerful, meaningful sites. Like... It's, it's just too good to like be able to on the play, your opponent plays one of the three drop sites and just like kill it for free. That's right. Because you, you like, because this this card was four at one time during testing, and your your opponent would just like go turn three, uh, prototype development base, and you would play an influence, and then just like trade your tactic and influence card for their two Solarium site, and it happened all the time. It was just miserable. Mm -hmm. um, at five, you at least like get to the point where. Uh, you can't kill their best site with it. Right. And five sets up nicely for the future with Power Broker, right? Like Power Broker brings Anarchy online sooner uh, in Escalation, which is exactly what we wanted. So 
you know, you, if you reduce anarchy to a four threshold for that reason we just talked about, and then bring power broker in, th- there was a chance you could yeah. see an even and earlier play of anarchy that was much. There's more there's a couple ways in uh in the escalation series that you can like cheat the threshold cost of your tactics. So That's leaving right. it at five is is good. It gets a little spicier. Yep. Yep, it, it card comes into its own in escalation. It's solid, and and now at one CC and, and at one CC, uh, it's good now. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's obviously the biggest change is just the reduction of construction costs from two to one on it. So minor change, but it is a big one in terms of deck building and how that anarchy package can come together inside of the good, the bad, and the savage. So I should have right. gotten out a assassin strike too, right? Yes. Yep. Because okay. Assassin Strike. Yep. So love to you. Assassin right. Strike and Distraction are in the same camp here, uh, where we added the preemptive to them. Yep. So preemptive, for those of you that don't know, is a is an is an ability that says that if you are the player to go second, I think Assassin Strike has the helper text. Maybe if I'm. Uh, it's actually on. Dead on arrival. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, anyways, what it, what it says is that if you're the off initiative player or the player to go second, then the threshold value of the card is reduced to the threshold va- to the value behind the preemptive. So if you're off initiative with Assassin Strike, it is now a preemptive two card. Um, what we found with Assassin Strike was that it, it, it has plenty of uh, its own drawbacks. In, in other words, like... The activating of your own combatant is a, is a cost that uh, the Excellarians can sometimes ill afford, but it does work pretty well with Anarchists on the battlefield. And if you don't have the Solarium to pay for the Anarchist that particular turn, he makes a great Assassin tar- Assassin Strike uh, unit for you, uh, combatant. Uh, you know, and then of course the, the ability is super strong, and the the fact that it flat destroys means that you know against Protoans and things like that they they can't harvest against the Dratoon, they can't harvest. Yeah, you don't um, get any Tricentis guys. <laughs> that's right. Tricentis hates being assassin strike. I can promise you that. Uh, so we just felt like being off initiative, especially against some tempo uh, decks that were emerging in the the field, assassin strike with preemptive two. Uh, puts it in a better place to operate as the second player. Yeah. When it was when it was like a flat four every time, it felt really bad to like play Assassin Strike over Distraction because mm-hmm. you're like just a little bit slower, but Distraction just hits everything. Mm-hmm. And so this this adds a dynamic to this card that is really good because you know the the nature of Solaria like you end up there's there's just games where you know, your opponent plays turn two oath key or whatever. And if you just have like a reasonable start and have an anarchist in play, uh, you can like trade your assassin strike for their oath key right away to kind of stay in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, which it just wasn't doing before. And similarly, distraction the preemptive four is less impactful than the preemptive two, obviously, but uh, it's nothing else about the card changed so it only got better it's That's not right. like adding preemptive four made it worse somehow yep so and there's there's uh both of these pieces were done by wiz yakuza so not so fast was done by wiz and and so was uh uh so was distraction i think he did an excellent job of capturing uh exactly what both of those cards embody so. yeah the assassin strike guy just looks so awesome yeah yeah he's, like, he's, he's got a big cape and yep exactly so he is cooler than you Yep, that's true. So both of these cards, uh, both of these cards got just preemptive. That was their changes, but uh, we think those are significant to how they impact the game. So uh, look forward to to seeing how you guys leverage these cards so, with, with preemptive. Uh, before we talk about village, did I miss any? Like, I think this was all of them. I think that's it. I mean, do, do we want to bring out uh, disruption first and talk right. about it? Because I think it got preemptive as well, if I remember right. Yeah, um, I don't think that Crazy Joe changed, but we didn't talk about him in the no Crazy Joe didn't change. There, but yeah, yeah. So, a... so if you pre-ordered uh, Good, the Bad, and the Savage, you're going to get four copies of Disruption. If you come to Nationals uh, just for participating, you'll get four copies of Disruption. Um, and those four copies that you get from Nationals are going to be full art versions of the cards. And this picture is so sweet. 
It is. Um, so, but the only thing we really changed in Disruptions case was that we gave it preemptive three. So much like the Excellarian getting that, um, uh, you know, earlier ability to play, we wanted this card to feel that way as well. Right. The the big kicker, of course, being that on the draw, you want to be able to counter their Art of War. That's right. <laughs> and, or Bloodlust. Uh, or Bloodlust. Uh, and uh, before you couldn't, now you can. Yep, that's right. Yep. So we are um, we are uh, very happy with the way that turned out. And obviously the Ascari just nailed the, the total embodiment of what this card is. And uh, in fact, uh, be prepared. I think this is your play mat for nationals this year too. So now you're just giving away too many things. I, I know, I know. I'm telling everybody all the secrets. So uh, if well, they made it just this far you get the stream, open. yeah. But <laughs> if somebody makes it this far into the stream or makes it this far into uh, watching it post stream, they'll, they'll get a little secret hint of what's coming next week. So, um, all right. So let's uh, let's jump over to Keshel. And we then, change not casual village. Or not casual village. I'm sorry. I, I'm yeah, let's put the let's put the rest of this stuff away because it's like not as important. Right. This this is a big change. This is a big change. So, of all the cards that we've talked about today, you know, uh, like layer to a certain extent actually changed the functionality of some cards, but just like barely, just like a little bit, and the other things were just you know like numbers changes. Uh, I guess we gave quick to the anarchist, but again, all the cards function in the same space that they functioned before. We just like tweaked them to where they work a little better, but they or do. worse in maybe some cases, but better mostly. Right. So village is totally different. And we talked about it on stream before. So again, if you're uh, a recurring viewer, you'll know, but um, this card's ability used to be activate target combatant. You control target X and combatant. You control can't be defended this turn. That was like a fine ability. It had good stats for a side or whatever, but we nobody like ever really played it because retrofitted relay station was so similar. It made to Solarium. Its stats were similar, but it was one CC instead of two. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just, it was like a bad pairing kind of where they just fought and village never won. But now we have new village that yeah. has a completely new ability. Its stats are shrunk a little bit to make up for it, and it's 3cc, but this is a powerful effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are putting um, the effect of activate, reset, target, accelerate, and combat, and you control, and it cannot attack this turn. Uh, Nick Jisba did the art on this card. I love the art. It, it, it it's sweet, yeah. Clearly identifies, like, you're entering into this uh, nomadic... Um, you know, residency uh, for the Exilarian. Clearly there's uh, uh, one of the tribal counselors of the Exilarian must live here because there's a nice big house sitting up on top of the hill. Um, you know, it's, but just talking about this ability for just a step further. So obviously it cannot attack this turn. So, you know, for those of you that are, are hoping to be able to like uh, drop out Tacky, reset him and attack with him, like that's just not going to happen with the village. But this card uh, takes all of the direct damage, anarchist, you know, uh, headhunter. You can get headhunter back online a little sooner because to, to just clarify the headhunter for just a second, since she exhausts, uh, you can't bring her all the way back to a reset position. You can just bring her back to an activated position with village. But if something's exhausted and it's rotated 180 degrees and you reset it, it rotates to activated 90 degrees. That's, that's right. So uh, just just for clarity on that. But I just I think it's important for people to understand like that just activating headhunter and then using village to bring her back so that the next turn you can use her again. That's a powerful ability and that's a scary, strong ability. Um, right. You know, so we we um, we felt like what was happening to the Exilarian was this kind of situation where they don't they didn't win the early game. They were sometimes with the right card combinations winning the mid game. Uh, but if it went long game, like they were they were really taking control of the game at that point and winning. And we felt like they just needed a little bit of a tempo boost in the mid game. And so this is where village provides that, that ability for them to come yeah, in. It, it has some really like interesting, like reaching uh, abilities that, you know, aren't even obvious. Like, like the obvious one is like, 
like Zed, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like this is where Zed lives, and he loves it there. And even though it's a lot of CC points to play those cards, like they just go together great. Mm -hmm. If you play your Zed, you get to use them right away. If you have the Zed reset already, like you get to gun down two guys. He's it, it's a hell of a thing. And uh, Warden works similarly, though you have to like be more careful what you fight with the Warden because you don't get to reset it if it dies. Right. Um, to be clear, if you if you like activate Warden's bounty ability and then village it, uh, you have to let the whole stack resolve before it resets. So uh, it'll reset. Then the bounty will happen. Then you'll have the opportunity to move to another window. So if it didn't win that fight, you can't like use it again, even if it's reset. Right, because you'll still die. Um, but it's still good with and and obviously it's good with Solomon and with Tunnel Rat, like and like you said, uh, um, Headhunter, because they all just have like effective activate abilities, and this mm -hmm. lets you get all extra activations. Mm-hmm. Well, so there's a couple of things that I really love about this card, too, that are a little less obvious. I mean, I, I mean, before we jump into those less obvious ones, obviously just getting Solomon back up or getting Tunnel Rat back up is huge value as well. Um, but but uh, the, the not so obvious is, is a combat trick. It's not really a trick when you're not, it's on the board and your opponent can see it, but um, it is that if you attack in with say like a tacky and your opponent um lines up a defender and then proceeds to um you know buff it to to kill it through a frenzy or something like that um village can actually get your guy out of combat yeah this this like as long as you have like untapped village in play your opponent just can't play it's a trap on you that's right you, like attack into their stuff and they try to it's a trap you and you can just like reset your guys to remove them from attacking Right, and you know that that was why we made the rules change last year, that uh, you can't use activate powers to remove yourself from combat. Like project is used to just like attack sites, and then if it turned out bad, he would just like activate his ability and be safe. Can't do that anymore. But right. village does that in a pseudo way. That's right. Where... So it's a, it's a little <laughs> less obvious, and it's probably not as powerful and and impactful on the game because it's more situational but it is valuable i mean it's valuable and, to understand that that's a and that's it's information your opponent has so like it's not like you're ever really gonna get there it's a trap with it because they know it's there mm -hmm. but it just like like what are they gonna do not it's a trap you like they just sit there and like cry a little bit but that's right <laughs> i mean they it, can't <laughs> it is the by definition the faction is a control faction and so it is literally controlling the way they can play their cards at that point so yeah. i think it, it hits on all of the areas that we wanted to hit on with what um what we want the accelerating faction to do when it comes to combat and 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 specifically combat and accelerating was always intended to be this kind of guerrilla tactic style combat where they attack on their terms because they're at advantage and so in the past, that's been reserved to just not so fast to stopping the Itza traps and combat tricks like uh, frenzies. And and Village just adds an additional layer that means you don't necessarily have to use not so fast for those kinds of effects. You may still want to, you know, because obviously you, you reset the attack entirely, but uh, maybe um, maybe uh, that's not what you want to do in that scenario. And you, you just would rather wait out on another turn. And, and right. Uh, You're just... So. You're trading time instead of cards with the village, where like right. if you're not so fast and it's a trap, you your attack goes through and you like get a tempo out of it. But right. if you don't want to not so fast and you you feel like you have the time, you can just like take, like just be like, oops, I guess I attacked into an it's a trap and I back out, uh, like back it up and we'll try again next turn. Right, right. So I, I think that covers the overview of the Omega changes. I mean, I don't, uh, we definitely want to hear from you guys. I mean, if you think that's something you're really excited about, what, like, what are your deck builds going to be? So uh, over the next week, uh, not only are we going to announce the nationals and the prizes for nationals, but we're also going to um, 
uh, re, you know, get our deck builder updated and out there for you guys so that you guys can, can start building decks with these factions and, uh, be sure to share them. You know, I mean, obviously maybe some of you guys want to keep some of them secret. If you're coming to nationals, that's cool. Um, we understand that, but, uh, the deck builder is a great way to start tweaking on different builds and, 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 you know, start the testing process. Yeah, and if you guys have questions, if you guys like, you like this list is really cool, and you want to show it off, just like, you know, put it in Facebook in the community. Let us know. Like Jesse and I and John, I'm sure, uh, would all be happy to take a look at your deck list and help if you need, or just like tell you that you're awesome at whatever you want. <laughs> yep. And so for one other thing, really quick, for those of you, I know it's late in the stream. For those of you that didn't pre-order and didn't get Crazy Joe or Disruption, they will be on our website um, for sale as individual play sets in the versions that are in TTS right now sometime in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we'll be sure to post to our Facebook community that those are out there. Or if you want a second play set of them, copy, you know, like you want multiple play sets for your additional decks, uh, they will be available to, to purchase separately. Um, so it's, it's just something that if you pre-ordered them, you got them as a free bonus. Uh, now it's, it's, they're going to be, for those of you that didn't pre-order, uh, they're going to be a little extra charge to get them. And, uh, and then next year, uh, if, you know, when we release the, the, the mercenary pack and escalation, if you want to wait it out till then you can, and you'll get them as part of that, that escalation pack at that time. So as a, that, I think I covered everything on that, just as some clarity on those cards. And, and um, I know we're right up at the eight o'clock hour, so I don't think we're going to go through the artwork right now, but we'd love to hear what your favorite pieces are from the Excellarian. So again, that Facebook community is ideal for that. Yeah, we obviously you saw some of the artwork as we were flipping through the changes and stuff, but get excited. The rest of it's sweet too. And yep. uh, we'll Actually, be shipping them out in a week or two here. So. That's right. Yep. Hopefully, You'll see uh, him live. I think we're about two weeks away from arrival on those. Should be something like that. So, all right. Well, I think that does it for now. I appreciate everybody that jumped in. Hugo, thanks for joining us on stream tonight and chatting it up with us. Uh, and we will uh, talk a little bit about the the punch it streams in the coming weeks as well. So uh, there's going to be some changes to how we're going to do things on on Tuesday nights coming up here. So, thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you soon. Good night, guys. Thanks.